All right, so uh, I'll kick things off uh, and, and make the introductions while people uh, get back to their seats. I'm Teddy Downey, executive editor at the Capital Forum. I'm really excited to be uh, hosting this uh, 21st Century Trust Buster panel this afternoon. Um, we've got a fantastic set of speakers for you. And uh, I'll start uh, Sandeep Bahizan. He is a legal director at the Open Markets Institute and was previously regulations counsel at the CFPB. Um, he's a prolific writer and, you know, uh, recently uh, uh, his work was uh, cited uh, multiple times in the, uh, in, in the, in the AT&T uh, litigation. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 one of the judges asked, uh, uh, brought up his brief a couple times, so uh, he's done incredible work. Uh, Holly Vidova, uh, to his left, Holly is an attorney advisor to Commissioner Rohit Chopra at the FTC, has been with the commission since 1990 and has an incredible perspective across a, a number of different uh, commissioners as she's worked there. Uh, to her left, we have Tahir Amin, uh, the co-founder and co-executive director of IMAC. Uh, and an organization dedicated to reshaping patent law to better serve the public. And then to his left, we have Daniel Kishi of the American Conservative uh, Magazine. Is American Conservative? Uh, American Conservative Magazine. Daniel is a fantastic author and editor uh, uh, and has written some really interesting articles on uh, how antitrust uh, is, is, is in a conservative uh, tradition. Antitrust enforcement can be in a, a part of the, a, a conservative tradition. And so, um, you know, thanks, uh, thanks for everyone for being here. Um, I want to start, uh, start with you, Sandeep. I know you have uh, open markets. Uh, you and open markets have some specific uh, proposals for improving uh, antitrust and anti-monopoly enforcement and wanted to see what your, you know, sort of top uh, two or three uh, recommendations are there. Sure. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, unfortunately, Teddy, Teddy mentioned that a judge on the D.C. Circuit cited our brief approvingly. Unfortunately, his two colleagues either didn't read our brief or weren't persuaded by what we said. So I wouldn't get too, I'm not too optimistic about that case. <laughs> so I want to talk about what can be done under existing antitrust authorities to really tackle and tame the big three of the Internet, Google, Facebook, and Amazon. They clearly wield a great deal of power over what we see, what we buy, and also who is seen and who sells on the internet. I think the big question is, how do the tech giants fare under existing antitrust doctrine, under consumer welfare antitrust, as it's often known? I would argue that their growth involves likely violations of existing antitrust law or modest extensions of existing antitrust law. I absolutely believe that Congress should amend antitrust law and overrule the Supreme Court's judicial legislation in this area. But in the meantime, I think the agencies have ample authority to go after all three companies. So I'll start with Facebook and Google. Despite what they may say, both companies have actually grown in significant measure through mergers and acquisitions. So I'll just list some of these M&A activities. So Google acquired YouTube and DoubleClick Facebook bought Instagram and WhatsApp. So these companies were able to extend their dominance or buy up nascent competitors through these acquisitions. So if the agencies applied the Clayton Act's incipiency doctrine, many of these acquisitions would have been stopped. And it's worth remembering that the Clayton Act is a preventative statute unlike the Sherman Act. Agencies are supposed to interdict mergers with a reasonable probability of substantially lessening competition. And in the case of dominant platforms like Google and Facebook, vigorous enforcement of the incipiency standard is critical. Otherwise, we have a situation where they have, they've had carte blanche to neutralize nascent competitors through acquisitions. I would remind everyone of the DC Circuit's language in the Microsoft case from 2001. In that decision, the court said, suffice it to say that it would be inimical to the purpose of the Sherman Act to allow monopolists free reign to squash nascent, albeit unproven, competitors at will, particularly in industries marked by rapid technological advance and frequent paradigm shifts. So this was said in the context of the Sherman Act. 
For the explicitly preventative Clayton Act, we should not be allowing monopolist free reign to buy out nascent, albeit unproven, competitors at will. I think that's a very straightforward reading of the text and purpose of the Clayton Act. So turning to non-merger conduct, even here, I would argue Facebook have and Google have maintained their power through types of conduct we classically think of as monopolistic or exclusionary. And I'll focus mainly on Google because of the European Commission's case against the company over the summer. The EC alleged that Google required exclusive installation of the Google search app and Google approved versions of Android and conditioned access to the Play Store on installation of the Google search app. So this case actually fits very comfortably within the framework of contemporary antitrust. First, the EC alleged exclusive dealing, which is still a cause of action under sections one and two of the Sherman Act. And secondly, the EC alleged tying, and tying is actually an area where we still have a so-called per se rule. In the Jefferson Parish decision from about 30 years back, the Supreme Court said that tying by a firm with market power is presumptively or per se illegal. So the practices that the European Commission challenged are likely illegal under US antitrust law as well. And briefly talking about Facebook, the recent 643 revelations, these are the documents that the UK Parliament published and summarized last week, suggest that Facebook has engaged in many of the same types of conduct that Google engaged in. So that's Google and Facebook. Amazon is a somewhat different story. It's grown through different means than Google and Facebook. Of, of course, Amazon has also grown through mergers and acquisitions, notably its acquisition of Whole Foods in the summer of 2017. But it's worth emphasizing that there are critical differences. And I think there are two types of conduct by Amazon that have drawn a lot of attention. First is below cost pricing on eBooks and products like diapers. And the second is Amazon discriminating in favor of its own private label products on its marketplace. So these allegations implicate predatory pricing and refusal to deal law. And of all the areas of anti-monopoly law today, the Supreme Court has done the most damage in these two places through decisions like Brook Group, Trinco, and Linkline. So on the surface, Amazon seems to present a much more challenging antitrust case than Google and Facebook. But even here, I would argue, we don't have to wait for Congress to pass new laws. We fortunately have the Federal Trade Commission, which has extraordinary authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair methods of competition. And the FTC has authority to interpret this power to reach problematic business conduct that falls outside the prescriptions of the Sherman and Clayton Acts. So using Section 5 to attack Amazon's below-cost pricing and marketplace discrimination would be a relatively modest extension of existing antitrust doctrine. And Congress indeed created the FTC just for these types of purposes, to get around pro-monopoly judiciary and challenge novel forms of anti-competitive behavior. I think Amazon implicates both those concerns. So in conclusion, Am Facebook and Google have acquired and maintained dominance through conduct that likely violates existing antitrust law. And we have to remember, they have not acquired this power solely because of superior products and services or network effects. The real issue is the agencies have failed to e either fail to enforce existing antitrust law or use their authorities to their fullest. So we should recognize that these are all political choices and the product of political choices. Thankfully, it isn't too late. The agencies still have these power powers. It's just a question of whether they'll pick them up and use them. Thank you. And Holly, uh, I know you share some of the concerns mentioned here about the courts. What are some of the uh, proposals that uh, Commissioner Chopra has for, uh, you know, uh, upping enforcement? Uh, and and uh, you know, I, I know you have uh, some perspective and some ideas about um, the courts. So I'd love to get your take on this. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. And. Um, as an FTC employee, I have to give the standard disclaimer that my remarks here are my own and do not represent the commission or any commissioner. Um, so um, I think the most important thing the FTC can do today is exercise our unique Section 6 authority to conduct industry studies and also engage in competition rulemaking. Um, that's something Commissioner Chopra has written about. Um, the FTC has really unique authority here. Um, when Congress created the FTC in 1914, it didn't want to just duplicate the Department of Justice. Um, Congress 
foresaw that there was a need for an expert administrative agency to um, study business practices, to collect confidential data, and, and analyze um, the way businesses were operating and, and use that learning to inform um, how the antitrust laws should be developed and you know, the policies that should be undertaken. And um, you know, I agree with Sandy in a lot of ways that um, we have not been completely using that authority. Um, there have been a number of instances in the past where we have. We've done a number of um, 6B studies of various industries and industry pr practices. And um, uh, back in the 1990s, um, late Chairman Robert Potofsky um, used this authority when he uh, conducted his uh, set of hearings on um, global competition and innovation. Back then, he saw that there had been broad-based changes in the economy and um, he wanted to, to use the FTC's you know, traditional powers to look and see you know, what changes needed, you know, if any needed to be made. The concern back then was um, the, you know, the global competition that was um, uh, unfolding, uh, you know, whether the antitrust laws were at all impeding U.S. companies' ability to compete on a global basis, as well as whether um, you know, the, the vast innovation that was taking place whether companies were able to engage in, you know, uh, newly defined strategies that were anti-competitive and, and harmful to consumers, and um, you know, those hearings were uh, very fruitful for the agency. You know, there was uh, several outcomes that were very influential. Um, there were a series of reports that the agency wrote after those hearings, which then um, led the agency to um, do a series of intellectual property hearings and reports which then um, have sort of directed uh, a lot of the policy we've, work we've done with intellectual property and um, it also pointed us in the direction to uh, revise our horizontal merger guidelines, efficiency section. Um, you know, the current hearings that uh, Chairman Simons the FTC is, has underway today are modeled after those hearings and I think, you know, our current chairman deserves a lot of credit for undertaking that process. Um, you know, I think when the FTC, well, and the DOJ, when we bring cases, it's incredibly hard to um, try to get the right result when, you know, say it's a merger that's just come in the door. Um, we have to work so hard to gather the evidence and try to tell a story to the court. Um, you know, the courts aren't going to just listen to um, a subjective uh, opinion that, you know, the concentration's too high. They, they like to see real-world evidence. And, you know, the FTC, um, we're most effective when we have, um, you know, rigorous analysis based on studies. And, you know, I think that our 6B authority, you know, there's so much we could do with it in, you know, the marketplace today, what we're seeing. Um, you know, I think we could conduct 6B studies of, um, you know, particularly industries to see, you know, how the mergers have impacted innovation and competition and, um, you know, whether there have been greater entry barriers, you know, what is the rate of new startups. Um, you know, we could use um, the results of those studies to inform, you know, where should we do merger retrospectives and, and more targeted enforcement. Um, it's, you know, the cases that just come in the door through the Hart Scott Rodino um, filings, um, you know, we have to hit the ground running on those cases. But, you know, I think the FTC could use our authority to bring much more targeted cases where, you know, we can look to see, okay, where has there been a lot of consolidation? You know, where are we seeing that there's, you know, much fewer startups happening? And then, you know, pick some cases there. Um, you know, I think the best example of when the agency has used its 6B authority to um, sort of uh, get us back on track in terms of enforcement is um, in hospital mergers. Um, a lot of people are probably familiar with this back, but back in the 1990s, the FTC and DOJ had a whole string of losses in hospital merger challenges. I think there were like seven in a row that we lost, and um, the courts were not 
um, listening to our arguments on geographic market. Um, they didn't pay attention to um, the evidence we had about harm to managed care organizations. And um, it got so bad that the FTC pretty much just stopped enforcing the Clayton Act when it came to hospital murders. Um, when Chairman Muirs came on board in the agency in the early 2000s, you know, he was very aware of that and very disturbed by it. And he looked at you know, the unique authority that the FTC had to study industries, to collect business data, and he said, okay, we're gonna do a hospital merger retrospective. And he you know, put our Bureau of Economics in charge, and they, they did a series of studies. I think there were three host consummated hospital mergers. And you know they collected all sorts of data on pricing, and um, uh, the agency uh, created a new framework for analyzing hospital mergers. And you know the results of the retrospective were horrible. I mean, it, it showed that we were absolutely right in every case we brought. That the consolidation had just an immediate um, result of increased pricing, and so we used the results of that retrospective to sort of restart our hospital merger program. And um, it started with the <coughs> Evanston Northwestern case where we challenged that consummated merger. And we showed that, you know, after the merger, the hospital had raised prices over a thousand percent. And, you know, the business executives gave themselves, um, you know, huge bonuses, um, you know, a very bad result for patients. Um, uh, you know, we've used the result of that hospital merger retrospective for the last 10 or so years, and we've, you know, had a very successful run of challenging hospital mergers. And so I think that that's sort of a really good model that the FTC could use going forward. And, you know, I was very interested in what Mandy Reed said on the uh, prior panel about how Judge Leon in, you know, the AT&T case, he said that there, you know, he hadn't seen evidence of other vertical mergers with harmful effects. Well, you know, maybe the FTC, we can um, try to look at some particular industries and do a study and, you know, see whether there have been real tangible effects that we can point to. And, and that would be very persuasive to courts, I think. And just to stay on this really quickly, follow-up question. Um, is there some agreement uh, on the commission? Is there kind of a consensus that this 6B authority is, you know, something maybe could be used more in 2019 for this type of thing? Um, I know that our chairman is open to the idea, um, so I can't say for sure there's absolute agreement, but um, the commission absolutely knows that that, that is um, authority we have, and I think it's underutilized, but that doesn't mean we haven't used it. I mean, we, ha we definitely do use it. We did a um, patent assertion entity study using 6B authority. We did a merger, um, merger remedy study. Um, on the consumer protection side, there's, you know, literally, you know, at least a dozen. And so the real problem is the resources. Um, and this is, it's a huge problem. I mean, the FTC is short-staffed. Um, we need to hire more economists who can do these studies. We need technologists who will help, like, put the studies together. You know, with these um, tech platforms, I mean, there's so much about them that we don't know. You know, what data is it they're collecting? Um, what are they using the data for? I mean, I know we know a lot of that, but I think there's certain aspects of it that we don't understand. And, you know, we need to hire technologists who can help us, you know, craft the subpoenas we need to send out and to, uh, to collect the information. And then we can use that to inform how we can bring these suits. Um, Sandeep mentioned our standalone Section 5 authority. You know, I think he's absolutely right. That's a fantastic um, uh, tool the FTC has. However, it's controversial. You know, we haven't had tremendous success in the courts with our standalone Section 5 authority. Most of the cases we have using that authority are consents. And I think that we would be much more effective using that authority if we had, um, you know, real rigorous data analyses to, to back up the reason why we want to bring the case. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Thank you. And uh, to hear, uh, you know, we just did, had a lot of conversation about uh, about healthcare and uh, hospital uh, um, uh, mergers. Um, you know, I would love uh, for you to tell the audience about 
how you approach uh, monopoly uh, issues as it pertains to patents in the, in the pharmaceutical space. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I will say straight up I'm not an antitrust expert. I look at these issues of monopoly and consolidation through the intellectual property regime and particularly patents. Um, it's kind of almost a situation where I think with the antitrust trying to combat these uh, consolidations, the power, the monopolies, it's almost ex post. I like to look at a situation ex ante, how do we get there? What, do, what tools do we provide corporations? Now, of course, there's a fine balance between wanting to incentivize technologies, wanting to incentivize inventions or innovation, if you like to use a lower bar. Um, but at the same time, if we look at the modern patent system today, and particularly in the, uh, the pharmaceutical sector, um, because patents play a different role in different fields, the, the accumulation of patents by pharmaceutical companies in order to control markets is, is probably at its height. Um, we've done a number of studies where we've seen companies uh, filing over two, 300 patents in order to block off competition from getting into the marketplace. Now, are all these inventions over one particular drug? Uh, at least to our analysis, uh, we don't see that throughout the portfolio. What we see is a lot of gaming, a lot of strategy by corporations. Uh, to take, for example, Humira, a drug for which treats uh, uh, elderly in terms of inflammations. Uh, AbbVie has filed over nearly 270 patents. You've got companies who are settling in litigation rather than being able to come to market. Whereas in Europe, companies have been able to come to market and compete, and the prices have dropped 80%. And I was just picking up on what Holly was saying about studies. I think uh, a good uh, model, perhaps I know the FTC has done some great work in terms of challenging some of these pay-for-delay settlement agreements. Uh, but as, as Holly says, there's limited resources, and you have to bring these cases very astutely because corporations have now got smarter. They've started not doing pay-for-delay deals. They're using other incentives to uh, keep competitors off the market to uh, hold, hold the exclusivity. But the European Competition Commission report did a, um, a very interesting report back in 2010, which looked at the pharmaceutical sector, and they looked through the entire toolbox that uh, corporate uh, pharmaceutical companies use in order to uh, maintain their exclusivity and, and the cost that it has to the healthcare market in Europe, which was in excess of 3 billion uh, euros, which doesn't sound a lot, but that was just a limited amount of uh, products. And I think um, the way I see it, and, and someone can correct me if, if I'm, I'm perhaps uh, misjudging this, but if I look at the growth of intellectual property as a system since the 50s, since the scientific, science, uh, scientific technological re revolution, We've also seen a, a bigger waning of the competition policies and the antitrust policies. I think uh, intellectual property has become king. It's obviously the driver of economic growth, and I think the balance has tilted far too favorably to the people who acquired those properties. Now, of course, you want technological developments and R&D incentives, but I believe that uh, unless you start to fix uh, the, uh, the ex-ante uh, issue of this, i.e., where, where is the root of the problem? Where does it come, where does it happen upstream? And it happens a lot of it through intellectual property systems. Maybe not in some of the technology sectors where there are other ways to uh, uh, accumulate power, but it's certainly in the pharmaceutical sector, that's the evidence that we have been finding is that the, the patent system is a big driver of uh, a lot of the consolidation that's going on. And you look at it from a global trading system, the pharmaceutical industry is the driver of a lot of USDR policy and trade. Uh, when they go into trade policies, it's the pharmaceutical industry that is driving excessive IP policies. And, uh, and then it becomes even harder to fix those at home because once you've packaged it up into a trade deal, it's very hard then to turn it around here. So I would, I would ask the question, uh, what are we doing to uh, uh, redress the, both the pharmaceutical industry's power both abroad but also domestically in the United States? I, I think, uh, I mean, the reason why I want to have you on the panel is I think a lot of these ideas apply to tech as well in terms of accumulation of patents. And can you spend just a, a quick minute talking about what has happened at, at the patent office in the U.S. in, in terms of the bar. I know you mentioned this in, in our call, uh, 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 invention versus uh, utility, and you brought yeah. up innovation as a lower bar as well. But what, 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 ha what happened there, and how has that changed how, 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 how 
So, uh, yeah. so for any, any of you who are not versed in the realms of patents, uh, typically it's a, you, you have to show something because an invention is new, it's non-obvious, uh, as in to the person in that field. It has to have utility, some application in the uh, industrially. And also you have to show that the invention is disclosed in its uh, form that someone can practice it once it becomes off patent. Now, historically, if you look at it, the, 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 uh, uh, mostly it's a, it's, a, it's a space where private actors play because obviously they're the ones who are investing, they're the ones who are playing in that space. And if you look at the court decisions over the years, the standard of obviousness, which I think is the most uh, important part of the uh, patent social contract, has largely been uh, sort of diluted to the point where if you think about the patent social contract was about inventions, but now we talk about innovation. Now, I know these sound semantics, but innovation and invention are two different things conceptually. Innovation is bringing to market the commercialization of something. Invention is actually coming up with something genuinely new. Now, if you look at a lot of the patents in the pharmaceutical sector, we're applying the same science that was existing 20, 30 years ago. So, for example, putting three pills into one, that was done 30 years ago. And yet, we are still granting patents and 20-year exclusivity. Now, some people say patents aren't monopolies. Well, I think today, the way uh, litigation happens, I think they become a monopoly. So you can, you can debate the semantics of that. And, and I think what we need to do is we need to raise the bar again as to what it is to get a patent, make it worthwhile, because at this point, I feel it's been so devalued. And I think innovation as a term is devalued. I think we use innovation in so many different ways that industries hide behind it in order to accumulate power. And uh, I think we have to question those things, which particularly within the realms of the patent system. Because if we don't, what we're doing is we're going to end up with these excess monopolies. Because anybody can then accumulate that power and use litigation as an excuse. Because particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, and I, I think Scott Gottlieb at the FDA has done some wonderful work in trying to curb some of these excesses, but he said litigation will solve the problem. I don't think so. Uh, because if you look at the case of Humera and Abvi, you have seven biosimilar actors who've just signed agreements because they can't be bothered to work their way through this thicket of two, three hundred patents. Um, and that is a fundamental problem to society. It's a problem, problem. one in four Americans can't afford their health care. Uh, they have to make a choice between putting food on the table or paying for their uh, medicines. I mean, is that a society that we believe that is equal and fair? I don't think so. And so when it comes to the patent system, I think just to Teddy's point, uh, it's uh, we have muddied the, the, the value of a patent system so much that it's so much easier, all in the idea that we're growing technology and we're growing e the ec economic growth. But the growth is only happening for some people and not for many others. And I think the patent system is at the root of that. And, and I know it's hard for some people to believe that and hear that because we think it's the engine of the economy. But uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's lost its uh, balance and uh, it needs to be remedied if we are gonna solve all these other problems with related to competition. I want to come back to uh, this issue of, uh, you know, what are the, what are the goals of these uh, rules, of these anti-monopoly and patent rules, uh, in a minute. Um, and, and Daniel, um, you know, uh, I think sort of this uh, popular, or, or sort of the, a lot of the attention on uh, the anti-monopoly movement is, is really on, on the left. Um, you work at, at a magazine called The American Conservative. Uh, why don't you t talk about how you think you know, anti-monopoly uh, enforcement or antitrust enforcement, it, it, you know, um, sort of uh, lines up with conservative values. Uh, yeah, so I'm not a trained economist <coughs> or a lawyer, um, but I am a journalist at a publication called The American Conservative, so I can give some sort of a uh, political economic perspective um, for why I think uh, the anti-monopoly movement should be construed in a conservative uh, framework. Um, I think the fundamental reason is the conception of the American citizen as simply one of a consumer rather than one of a producer and a worker um, is uh, perhaps beneficial in the short term, um, but I think it's had some long-term implications, uh, some of which have come to the front uh, with the, you know, perhaps the election of Donald Trump or the successful candidacy of Bernie Sanders. Um, I think the, to speak to sort of the big tech firms themselves, uh, Facebook and Google's uh, digital ad duopoly um, has gutted the revenue stream of a lot of local and regional investigative capabilities of, of these newspapers. 
Um, it's also given them a uh, monopoly on the flow of information. Uh, they're now gatekeepers. And I think that has uh, some broader implication of the free flow of um, information and ideas. Um, with Amazon, I think that they've uh, done much to undermine the uh, viability of uh, small businessmen as well, uh, sort of on the Main Street, Middle America uh, communities. And sort of the combination of these has contributed to these regional inequalities where we sort of have uh, very affluent enclaves on the coast, uh, Silicon Valley, Washington, D.C., and New York City, um, and sort of uh, stagnation or decline in middle of America um, with sort of these increased economic power, we see uh, increased political power as well, uh, which I think has uh, you know, negative consequences in terms of sort of subverting democratic rule. And um, you, uh, just to stay on this, what exactly about that do you tie to uh, conservative ideas, this, you know, the, you know, um, uh, you know a, a, a conservative tradition? Yeah, so the um, sort of the health and vibrancy of, uh, you know, locality, cities, uh, communities, um, perhaps, you know, are, I think, fundamentally a conservative ideal, because if you don't have sort of strong uh, local vibrant markets, uh, you're going to see sort of stagnation and you're going to see uh, downstream political consequences that um, perhaps some might not want. And so, um, you know, I, I was reading through the sort of the mission of, uh, uh, of the American Conservative Magazine, and I, I noticed it's, uh, you know, one of the, I, you know, goals is, is to, um, is that an economy isn't, you know, and I, I made this point earlier uh, about how it's not just about buying cheap stuff. Uh, there's, a, there's a section in there about, you know, improving, uh, 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 you know, making sure that, you um, citizens can, you know, flourish, you know, like a fl flourishing citizenry. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of gets me back to the, uh, that I want to kind of ask everyone, what are the, what are the goals? What are, you know, what's the benefits of anti-monopoly enforcement? What are, what are the goals of these laws um, if, the, if they're not about uh, buying cheap stuff uh, and, and low prices? What are, what are the goals of all, all this additional enforcement that you think is kind of important to, to highlight? Go back. Sure. So, if you look at the purpose of antitrust historically, you don't have to go back that far. You know, to the mid '70s or early '70s, it was clear that the laws were about decentralizing private power to limit corporate power over citizens and our capacities as consumers, workers, entrepreneurs, and ultimately as citizens. So, we had a much more expansive understanding of this body of law in 1972. Uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall, in a decision called Topco, described the Sherman Act as the Magna Carta of free enterprise. It was a very expansive vision, a body of law that was supposed to control and limit private power. And unfortunately, since then, we've had executive branch officials and judges rewrite these laws based on really nothing, based on the shoddy history of Robert Bork to say that we only care about consumer welfare uh, narrowly, narrowly defined to mean price and output. So Congress hasn't changed the laws. What we've really seen is a executive and judicial coup against our historical understanding of what antitrust is supposed to do. And, you know, Holly, I, I mean, just specifically at FTC, I mean, it, it does seem like you know we, we write a lot about mergers and, and conduct enforcement and things like that. It really, a lot of the time, it does come down to this idea about. Uh, low prices. Can you prove that this is going to uh, increase price? Um, and that is the you know that, that that's the main thing that they're looking for. But do people at the FTC think about other things beyond just price when they're thinking about enforcing against something? Do they think about um, it, it, you know uh, ideas like liberty or, or small businesses or, 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 or wages or. or and, and, you know, I, I, I uh, was listening, listening to uh, Bruce Hoffman earlier, and, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me is, you know, 
some of the mistakes that Facebook makes and, and it, Google makes when when they make mistakes when they don't police their networks and um, you know oops uh, you know there's a genocide uh, somewhere or oops you know uh, you know a, an election got thrown uh, in favor of a, 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 you know a fascist dictator or something like that I mean these are these are pretty big mistakes and so the stakes here are very high it seems yeah no I I agree with you the stakes are very high but I I will say this the FTC staff we're we're very dedicated to try to protect competition. And it's not just about prices. I think what has happened with pricing evidence is that that's the easiest way to win. Um, in fact, you know, going back to what I said earlier about our hospital merger enforcement um, program, you know, the retrospective we did, I think in part the reason why that was so successful is because we were able to show that prices skyrocketed up, and you know that's just like slam dunk win. Um, but we absolutely do go after innovation cases. But I think there's a lot more we can do. But you know our CDK Global Automate case, um, that was all about innovation. Um, you know Automate was it, this was about um, uh, auto dealer software, and Automate was um, the firm that was being acquired by CDK. K Global, and it, it had a really small share of the market, but um, it was having an outsized impact on competition um, with other platforms, especially CDK, the dominant one. And um, Automate was poised to become an even more effective competitor in the near future. And it would have, you know, the merger would have eliminated that nascent competition. And, you know, it just so happened in our investigation, we were able to collect some really good, strong evidence. And, um, you know, so. And that was a success for us. Um, I believe they abandoned the transaction. I want to double check that, but we did have a win there. And um, so we do look for innovation harms, but the the problem is sometimes it's really hard to show that sometimes. And that's why I, you know, really think the most important thing we can do with what's going on today in the economy is use our Section Six. B and 6G authority to do industry studies and also competition rulemaking. You know, Commissioner Chopra wrote an article about our competition rulemaking authority and um, about how, you know, FTC Commissioner Phil Elman, you know, 50 years ago, he gave a really seminal speech and he said, look, um, you know, we have this unique authority here. Um, Congress didn't want us to just be um, developing the antitrust laws by doing, you know, case by case by case. It, it, you know, it's slow, it's tedious, and it's not very open. Um, you know, it's, it's only the party's interests who are um, weighing in at the court to, you know, how the case should be decided. And yet those cases are what is, you know, the development of the antitrust law. Um, competition rulemaking is very open. Um, you know, anyone can participate in it. And um, you know that's something that's been virtually unutilized by the FTC. And I think we had a really huge missed opportunity uh, to do a competition rulemaking 10, 15 years ago in standard setting. You know, a lot of the problems we're seeing with patent abuses, it's, it's, it's a lot of it's closely associated with standard setting bodies in high tech. And, um, you know, back in the mid 1990s, we had our Dell com com uh, computer case that was about standard setting. We brought our Rambus litigation, which we lost. That was a lot about standard setting. And, um, you know, I think the FTC could have done um, a competition rulemaking surrounding standard setting that, that could have been, um, you know, very powerful. But I think at this point, it, it's probably too late. Um, but, you know, going back to what Sandeep was saying, um, you know, I think that the, the antitrust laws are so important to our country because um, our companies, when they are um, faced with competitive threats, when they have to keep working hard to, you know, to innovate and, you know, they, they've got other firms sort of nipping at their heels, that's what keeps the company strong. and. Um, it makes us more competitive in the global economy. You know, I think studies have shown that when countries have strong antitrust laws at home that helps keep their companies competitive, they're more competitor 
more competitive um, with their international competitors. I think in Japan, um, there have been some studies or writings about how you know the Japan wasn't really enforcing, you know, didn't have strong enforcement of the antitrust laws, and it, it you know, it, some people think it's part of the recession that they had. You know, their companies were faltering because they were these lazy, dominant firms. And uh, I want to. Uh, I've got a couple more questions. Do we? How, how many? How much? Uh, all right. I'm going to ask one more question. Well, let's open. Let, let's open it up for to the audience for questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to keep going. And I have a couple more. Um, so, um, it, you know, I do want to stay on this this issue of like what are the benefits because I, I, I do think that there's just so much conversation about price all the time. Um, and, but and to hear, I know you guys. I know your group has uh, done a lot in terms of, uh, you know, you've had a lot of success in the past um, in, in 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 trying to uh, reform patent law in other countries. Um, I you know, I know you've done a lot of analysis of what you know uh, you know uh, addressing patent thickets and things like that would would uh, do. I know a lot of it is price. You know, so you know, is, is there a what is the what are the numbers that we're talking about in terms of you know effect on the economy and things like that of improving the patent laws and and also like what are the, what are the other benefits that you, you would see by improving them? Yeah, I, I, as I was listening to Sandeep and uh, Holly, one of the things that comes to mind is is in terms of being a, a competitive society, is we think pat does this does this uh, at least in the pharmaceutical sector and I was a, I was on a panel at the FTC a month ago where Bio was representing. Uh, their case and they said oh well competition between branded manufacturers is competition and usually you only get about one or two in a particular drug sector and if that's our idea of competition then you know we're doomed because what you what you have is you have two people basically setting up the marketplace for themselves and I think patents play a, a very important role in that uh, and, and so I think we need to ask the question what does competition mean to us in those kind of sectors uh, the other thing is I think uh, uh, an another consequence is, is um, when you have patents, the way companies set up their patents, and again, I'm only talking for the pharmaceutical sector, that's what I've studied, is companies really do file their initial patents really broadly, and they basically enclose off a huge space, such that the consequence of that is other actors can't compete in that space, and they can't do research in that space. So when we're talking about innovation or inventions or new developments, a lot of actors can't potentially play in, in a particular space because of the excessive scope of patenting that companies can get away with. And only it's only through challenging in litigation and what have you do we get these, this, this if you imagine a fence that's constructed, do we get these fences sort of uh, shape uh, brought back? But uh, a lot of the times, uh, who can afford to do that litigation? Who's gonna do it? And so I think in a way, we're kind of probably hurting our competitiveness and our growth and innovation because of the excessive patenting that's going on and the way we allow companies to overly take a larger share of the, the sort of uh, land than they should. Uh, there's a common technique that companies use. They literally scorch the earth of a research area such that nobody can really enter in. And then you've got this huge transaction cost of trying to pick your way through these thickets in order to even get access to the marketplace. And a lot of companies that I've spoken to, at least in the comp the generics or the biosimilars, they say, well, it's not worth our while. Why would I spend all these millions of dollars without any guarantee? And that's why they end up settling. It's just not worth it. And so uh, in, in that sense, and I think it's, it's not just about price in that sense. It's, it's about basically how are we driving research? How are we driving a, a more uh, open uh, 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 forum for other actors to do development? Because at the end of the day, if a certain number of actors are determining how research is going to be done, they're going to then determine what products you get. They're going to then determine what treatments you're going to have. And at the end of the day, that's not what exactly what we want in a free open market society. Uh, because at the end of the day, there are consequences to that. Uh, it's only then profit driven and not really for the betterment of society. And uh, I want to reopen it up for questions. I'll ask any, any questions. Um, with regard to the idea of using rule making more, um, particularly when you mention Rambus, I'm interested in the extent to which the FTC feels it could basically uh, do rule making 
on points that they've lost in court. Um, I mean, it seems like that would be really strongly opposed during the rulemaking process and would itself entail a lot of litigation over the rule. Um, so Rambus is the one example where we've lost, but we had a huge win in the Unical case uh, where we sued Union Oil Company that um, engaged in misrepresentations and omissions before the California Air Resources Board, which was a standard setting organization coming up with a new standard for reformulated gasoline in California. Um, Union Oil Company represented to the CARB Board that it did not have any proprietary um, coverage over the uh, standard that the, um, the car board was coalescing around while at the same time it was going out and getting a patent on the technology. Um, we sued them and um, the remedy was that they had to give up their patent. Um, you know, that was a huge win for the FTC. Uh, Chevron bought them and then they, they settled. Um, so, um, you know. Is Qualcomm, is the recent Qualcomm case relevant to this? Well, so Qualcomm is a case in active litigation, and you know the standard-setting issues are relevant to it. Um, it's a huge undertaking by the agency. Um, uh, you know, I, I would not say that we should engage in rulemaking in cases where we've lost. Not at all. That's not what I was trying to say, really. I, um, um, I think. Competition rulemaking can be helpful in the way, almost like the way you think of our merger guidelines. Um, you know, I mentioned Commissioner Phil Elman's speech 50 years ago. This was before we had the merger guidelines, and he was very disturbed about how you know the merger cases were going. You know, the, just the development was just case by case by case, and um, he wanted to do a competition rulemaking um, on a variety of different things he thought we should do, but uh, one of the things we did do was we developed the merger guidelines. That wasn't a rulemaking, but you know, the, the horizontal merger guidelines are extremely influential and important in the cases we bring. And so, um, you know, the idea of a competition rulemaking in, um, you know, some of the areas that Commissioner Chopra has talked about and, you know, what I think we might have been able to do 10 or 15 years ago in standard setting would be something along the lines of, you know, guidance and, you know, setting out what the burdens are, what the standards are. Um, it, it would make any litigation that did occur much more streamlined. Thank you, Parker. Well, thanks. Uh, please uh, give a, a thank you to our panel here. <laughs> and, hey, in, in, in this, these, these